We're talking this afternoon with Frank Viola, who's a pretty influential voice. We're talking with him today specifically about a a book that he has out called Pagan Christianity, with a question mark, exploring the roots of our church practices. We're going to dig into that a little bit with Frank. Hi, how you doing? Welcome to the Family Life Network. Oh, doing well. Appreciate you having me on. Now, the title of this book intrigued me, Pagan Christianity, question mark. What's the book about? I mean, what led you to, uh, to want to put these thoughts together in book form? Well, I guess I would begin by saying that some 20 years ago, I did something that right now millions of Christians are doing every year, and that is I left the institutional, traditional church. Mm -hmm. But I didn't leave the Lord, and I didn't leave the body of Christ. I just found an alternative way of gathering what many would call organic church. Mm -hmm. Very primitive, very informal, but uh, very intense at the same time in terms of the commitment and the devotion to Christ and to one another. And so having done that, and the reasons why I left the institutional church, uh, all of that provoked in me a study on how did we get into the place we're in now? How was it that Christian churches today have taken on the form, the structure, the leadership format? How did we get the traditional church service, which personally I have always found very boring. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm sure that's not the case with everyone. Obviously it's not. But for me personally, and I've, I've been into many different denominations, movements and churches, I've always found it somewhat of a yawn. So consequently, I wanted to really find out how is it that the church evolved or devolved, however you want to (laughs) see it, from what we had in the first century. Because one of the things that I have observed, in my opinion, it's the opinion of other scholars as well, is that the first century church, the early church, uh, the way that the church is met in the first century is very different from what we have on the planet today. And so consequently, I wanted to set out to find out how we got into this place. What was the evolution or devolution? How did it happen? So that really is the provocation for the book. And I I did a study, which took a number of years, on the origins of where we got all of our church practices from. And quite frankly, it was shocking, because very little of it comes from the Bible. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's 2,000 years later. It's impossible that things wouldn't be changed or wouldn't be added. But, I mean, we've added a lot of stuff. Things are really different. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the core points of the book. You know, we're not talking about things like, well, let's go back and wear togas and sandals. Mm -hmm. Let's speak Koine Greek and all that. Uh, We're talking about the timeless principles of the ecclesia, the Church of God, that were taught by Jesus Christ himself and the apostles. So we're talking about those things that don't move. And what we basically say in the book, after we take the reader through history and we show them where all these things that we do came from, we then show that essentially modern Christianity, and this has taken hundreds of years in development, has redefined the church of the living God from what it was in the New Testament, in the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. And for us, that's no small thing. We can't really just wink at that and turn our head and ignore it, especially those of us who are evangelical Christians, and we say that our practices and our beliefs and our behavior is rooted in the Bible. What are some of the most common practices that we would all take for granted, but that actually, you know, don't have any true biblical basis? Well, we're going to lose a number of your listeners, (laughs) Max. 20 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank but you. <laughs> believe it or not, the modern pastor as we know it today, I'm talking about the office and the role, yeah. has absolutely no scriptural evidence whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Let me throw this out to your listeners. Go into your New Testament and try to find a man who preaches sermons to the same congregation week after week, month after month, year after year. Mm-hmm. Try to find a man who marries the living and buries the dead. Try to find a man who's called the head of the church and who represents the church in the world. Try to find a man who blesses civic events, baptizes converts, and essentially makes the decisions for a church. Basically, if any of your listeners can find that man in the New Testament, I'll eat the Bible without salt. (laughs) Uh, He just doesn't exist. And what we find historically is that the modern pastoral role evolved out of the Catholic priest. Mm. This is very solid historically. You can trace it from the beginning on. And the first century shepherds, the first century elders were very different creatures, with a very different role, a very different ministry than what we have today that we call pastor. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of the biggies. Yeah. Um, (laughs) 
especially for a Protestant, you know. I guess another one close to it would be this idea of church being defined as a place you go, sit down, sing a few songs with the worship team, and then listen to a sermon for right. 45 minutes. Yeah. Uh, you can't find that anywhere in Scripture. Mm-hmm. Basically, the modern-day church, concept of church, I'm talking about the service, is basically a show. Yeah. I mean, you go and you watch. Yeah. And you're passive. You're not active. You're, you're passive. passive. About the most you'll do is, you know, open your mouth and maybe raise your hands if you're Pentecostal and get to dance a little bit if you're charismatic. <laughs> uh, you really don't function. You really don't minister. You go there to get. You bring your empty bucket mm. and you say, fill me up. And it is the pastor's responsibility to give you everything you need for the Christian life in that two-hour service on Sunday morning. Yep. And uh, if you're a super Christian, you'll go on Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, what we do is we compare this to the first century church meetings, and boy, you talk about galaxies apart in terms mm. of difference. That meeting in the first century, and, and this was not just a cultural thing. This was built into the very DNA of the church. Yeah. When Christians got together, boy, they all ministered to one another. They mm-hmm. all functioned. They all participated. And Jesus Christ was the literal head of that meeting. He was leading it, and he was revealing himself through the ever-member functioning of his body. And today, uh, as I said, it's basically a show. You sit down like a pillar of salt in a pew. You stare at the back of someone's head most of that time. You listen, you clock in, you clock out, and then you live your individual Christian life. So we challenge this on biblical grounds as well as historical grounds. Now, having done that, and certainly if if the roots are extra-biblical, if we could use that phrase, if they're extra-biblical in nature, other than just that it's part of the culture, does that necessarily make them wrong, or are they just part of the uh, historical evolution of the church? What's the upside? What's the downside? A lot of things that are extra-biblical, we would argue, are not wrong. For example, the carpets that many church buildings have, mm-hmm. the chairs that we sit in, all those things, believe it or not, were invented by pagans. <laughs> that doesn't mean they're wrong. Gosh, I'm a fan of carpets and chairs. Yeah. And I have no problem with the calendar that we use, right. uh, which is right. pagan in origin. Yeah. But we are are really addressing the practices that have redefined the church mm-hmm. and have, in a sense, violated mm-hmm. the New Testament teachings of what God designed the church to be. Okay, for example, let me give you a small example here. Yeah. Jesus Christ said to his disciples, it's recorded twice in the Gospels, he said, look at how the Gentiles lead. Basically, he said, <clears throat> they lord it over one another. And the Greek word there for lord it over, the words mean top-down leadership, mm. hierarchical leadership. Mm-hmm. And the Romans perfected that. They got it from the Babylonians. Yeah. And we see it all over corporate America. We sure. see it in our military. You know, you yeah. got somebody at the top, then you got others at the bottom, and then the rest of the little peons, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. way below being led by the top. It's hierarchical structure. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, this is how the Gentiles lead. And then he told his disciples, it shall not be so among you. Mm. And yet, the typical church, whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant, you have a hierarchical leadership structure. And we point out that this violates the teachings of Jesus Christ. And uh, we believe that that's wrong. So really the question is, does this practice hinder what God designed the church to be? Does it violate, does it contradict a principle of Scripture or a teaching that came from the lips of our Lord, of the apostles? And if it does, and we say we're evangelical Christians who believe the Bible to be authoritative, Mm -hmm. then we have a crisis of conscience. We have to make a decision and say, well, we're going to go with tradition, or we're going to go with the Word of God. And that's really what we're doing in this book. We're pushing that question to the reader and asking the reader to answer that question themselves. Do you think we're so heavily uh, enculturated and it becomes almost, you know, the whole evangelical subculture becomes its own entity? I mean, are we able to break out of that and look at things differently, or are we just so locked into it that this is the way it's always been, that tradition almost seems more real to us than Scripture does? an excellent question, and I think it comes down to the individual Christian. We have received thousands of emails and letters from people who have read the book since it came out, and by the way, to our shock and surprise, it's become a bestseller. Hmm. So there's a real Hmm. hunger and a desire for God's people to question what they're doing when it comes to church. The fact of the matter is, one million Christians a year, and I'm talking about adult Christians a year, leave the institutional church. That reveals something. Something's happening. And the interesting thing is, many of those Christians Christians are not leaving the Lord. They're finding the body of Christ in more primitive expressions. But getting back to your question, 
Uh, I would say to you, and this is interesting to me, mm-hmm. is that 85 to 90 percent of the mail that we get is basically saying something like this. You in this book have put language to what I have felt for many years as a Christian. Mm -hmm. I always knew something was wrong with church, but I just didn't know what it was. And now I know, and now my conscience is free, and I feel liberated, Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And interestingly enough, some of these letters are from pastors. (laughs) I got an email from a pastor not long ago, and he said, For the last 13 years I have felt guilty for taking money from God's people, Mm. for preaching sermons and being a pastor, when many of these people in the congregation are a lot poorer than I am. And then he raised all these questions, like one of them was, how come we spend all this money on buildings and maintenance and professionals just for two hours on Sunday morning? (laughs) You know? And uh, so consequently, it comes down to the individual Christians. There are some Christians, however, that for whatever reasons, they really have issues with the book, as if they feel personal threatened. Yeah. Some of them, quite frankly, have gotten angry. I'm not surprised, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> you understand. And, uh, you know, tradition is powerful. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ said this, and I find it arresting. He said to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I'm not implying that Christians are Pharisees and mm-hmm. Sadducees, but I'm using this analogy to talk about the power of tradition. Yeah. He talked about the fact that all throughout Scripture, you see that one of the most powerful forces in the universe is the Word of God. You know, in Isaiah, it says the Word of God will prosper wherever it goes. It will flourish wherever it's planted. In Hebrews, it says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, Mm -hmm. cutting asunder spirit and soul and so forth. And yet, Jesus makes this statement to the religious people of his day. He said, you have stopped the Word of God dead in its tracks by your tradition. Mm. By your tradition, you nullify. You make void the Word of God. I mean, if it could stop the Word of God, that's, that's something pretty powerful. It sure is. Well, now, the house church movement has been around for a while, but according to what I read or the people I know, some of whom are involved in it, it, it seems to be growing at a much faster rate uh, lately. Do you attribute that to a, a growing awareness, the fact that people are just feeling like they're missing something in a big church? Uh, No question about it, and the way I would put it is, right now we're living in a day where God's people are getting in touch with their spiritual instincts. Mm -hmm. We all have, as Christians, the Holy Spirit living in us, consequently have spiritual instincts. And those spiritual instincts, when we are in touch with them, they crave spiritual fellowship, authentic community, every member functioning, small group participation, family, I'm talking about the church as an extended family, and that which is real and living. And so consequently, what's happening today is we have millions of Christians, for whatever reasons, and I don't pretend to know the reasons, Mm -hmm. but we're living in a day where, I'll use George Barna's term, a revolution. There's a revolution happening. And God's people are getting in touch with their their inner spiritual instincts. And for that reason, many, many of us are leaving the institutional church, and we're finding Jesus Christ, and we're finding fellowship outside the walls of the church building. Mm Mm-hmm. And it is revolutionary. George wrote a book called Revolution in 2005, and Pagan Christianity is actually the sequel to that book. But he talks about this trend and how it's increasing, and he predicts over the next 20, 25 years, it's going to be a monumental shift happening in the Christian landscape. Well, as organic churches or house churches then uh, become more prevalent, and as they may be likely to grow, what are the downsides of that? I mean, do they run the risk that you think is affecting the broader church? I mean, getting too big or too programmed themselves? Oh, it's always a potential for an organic church to revert back to an institutional kind of format. There's no question about it. And there's an antidote to that. However, the potential is there. Mm -hmm. Also, too, the kind of problems that a Christian will face in an organic church are very different from what they'll face in an institutional church. Mm -hmm. To give them the flavor of what kind of problems we're talking about, all they got to do is open up the letters of Paul Mm -hmm. and read all the problems he had in Thessalonica, Philippi, the Corinthians, and you will get a good feel for the kind of problems that happen in organic churches. The interesting thing is that so many of the problems that the Christians were having in the first century that Paul was addressing never really happened in an institutional church. And it's because the people really don't get to know one another all that well, for the most part. And secondly, the kind of meetings we have in institutional church just don't fit the bill. Uh, For example, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talked about their chaotic meetings and how some were speaking over others and so forth. And one 
one of the anecdotes he gives is he says, well, when someone gets up to share in the church meeting, if someone is sitting down and gets a revelation and insight while the first person is speaking, let the first person speaking stop and be interrupted by the second person. Well, that would never happen <laughs> yeah. in an institutional church service. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no pastor is going to be interrupted by someone sitting in a pew, you know? Yeah, yeah. My point is, a lot of what's in the New Testament doesn't apply to our situation mm. because our entire schema and way of practicing church is so different. Yeah. But when you get an organic expression of the church, all of a sudden the New Testament comes to life because you realize we're having the same problems they were having. Exactly. And what Paul wrote applies to us <laughs> <Yeah>. perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know you've had a lot of positive response to the book, but what about the other side? Uh, what about the uh, the people who have not responded well to the book? The other response has been, why do you hate the church? <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> why are you angry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, George and I just kind of laugh at that. I've never been hurt by the institutional church. I've never been hurt by a pastor. Right. You know, I'm writing because basically I couldn't stay in it for my own spiritual survival, and I found something on the other side much better and more glorious, and I found out that what I discovered was really what the New Testament Christians found, at least in my opinion. Yeah. And it's not just me. I mean, there are millions and millions of Christians who have had the same experience, mm-hmm. yet lots of Christians don't know about them because they, until this point, major publishing houses like Tyndale and others have not published books that go into this kind of stuff. Yeah. So we're living in a day where something very new is happening, where a publisher like Tyndale House, second largest Christian publisher in the world, mm-hmm is willing to publish a book as radical as that, pagan Christianity, that tells you something's happening in the body of Christ that's, at least in America, unprecedented. Yeah. Hey, and and one last thing. There's a great quote at the beginning. It's in the introduction, and I think it kind of sets the tone for the whole book. It's a quote from Joseph Campbell. It says, There's perhaps nothing worse than reaching the top of the ladder and discovering that you're on the wrong wall. Boy. Yeah, I know. (laughs) I love it. If that doesn't describe things these days, you know? Oh, it does. I'll tell you what. Here's Frank Viola's feelings on the book. Yeah. Quotes in the book by authors and scholars and theologians is worth the price of the book. Oh, yeah. We load it up with these brilliant, masterful, genius quotations from people throughout history that for us, uh, those quotes alone are just worth the price of the book. I mean, they're, they're priceless. <laughs> it's a book I think you'll find challenging. It's called Pagan Christianity? Question mark. Exploring the roots of our church practices. We've been talking with Frank Viola, the author. It's published by Tyndale and available everywhere. Frank, man, I appreciate you, your heart, and your insight and where you're going for putting this out. I mean, I commend you because uh, it's something I really would encourage people to read. I think it's a message that uh, that we need to hear. Well, I so appreciate your kind words, and thanks so much for having me on. I'm honored to be able to do it.